Now, many nutritionists have felt that animal protein is the ideal protein for man. How did all that start? Back in the early 1900s, Osborne and Mendel, early investigators, were working with rats, and they wanted to see what foods make rats grow best and grow fastest. And they found very soon that cheeses, dairy foods, eggs, and so on were very good for rats, but vegetable proteins didn't do too well. And so they started what they call a PER system, protein efficiency ratio. And they rated the foods. For example, egg was 94%. Well, that's almost 100% efficient. Cheeses, dairy products, meats and fish were very high, 90 or 100%. Potatoes, only 67%. Beans and peas, only 42%. And in the early 1920s, as the investigations proceeded, the investigators said there must be something wrong with vegetable foods. There must be something incomplete compared to animal foods because they don't let rats grow too well. And the term incomplete has been widely misunderstood by present-day nutritionists and dietitians. Present-day nutritionists and dietitians seem to think that the word incomplete means not all the amino acids. It's not a complete protein. Well, that's completely untrue because when the term was first used, we didn't even know how to analyze for all the amino acids. When they said incomplete, they meant that there's something mysteriously missing because they don't make rats grow as fast as the animal proteins. And that, unfortunately, has stayed in the literature, the nutritional and dietetic literature, and so that many nutritionists, many dietitians are treating their patients like rats. They're referring them and recommending the rat diets instead of giving them human diets. Because when we find, when we talk about human diets, it's much different than the rat diets. For example, we first started testing with humans to see the difference between vegetable and animal proteins, we get rather surprised. Dr. Knapp, for example, in this Corpus Christi hospital, uh, treated young infants, five to 14 months old, uh, on two different diets. One was a diet primarily vegetable proteins, and the other was primarily uh, milk, a milk diet. And he found it didn't make any difference to these infants. They all both grew just as well as each other as long as they got the same amount of calories. In fact, not only was there no difference in what we call nitrogen retention, that is the amount of protein retained for growth and so on, and no difference in growth rates, but the children actually did better on the vegetable proteins compared to the milk proteins. These children were studied in India by Dr. Reddy. These children were two to five years old, and he was worried about giving them wheat because in animal studies, wheat it has a different amino acid composition and percentage than egg. And since egg is considered as the ideal protein by many because it works well with rats, that we try to model all foods after the pattern of egg. And if the amino acid composition of other foods are not similar to egg, we think that it's inferior. Now, one amino acid called lysine is only half the quantity, half the percentage in wheat as it is in egg. So what Dr. Reddy did was to double the lysine uh, content by adding it to the wheat diets to make it equivalent to egg, to see if that helps children grow, because it does help animals grow. And after experimenting with these children, two to five years old, he found no difference at all in growth, as long as they had enough calories. So that didn't work out. Now, if you feed rats rice, plain rice, they hardly grow at all. But if you feed them rice and just add 1% chicken, the rats do pretty well. So Dr. Lee at Purdue University decided to take 20-year-old young men and see what happens to humans when you feed them rice diets. And he fed one group 100% rice, and the other group had 15% chicken and 85% rice. Let's see what happened. After a period of many weeks, when he checked them out again, he found that those on the rice alone retained about 20% more protein than those on the rice and 15% chicken. It was a real surprise. And yet the amount of rice that was used was only about 6 or 7% of total calories, one-third of what the average American eats. And that was plenty for these 20-year-old young active people. And more than that, the rice wasn't even worth eating. It was plain white starchy rice 
All the minerals taken out, all the vitamins taken out, and all the dietary fiber taken out. Hardly worth eating, and yet the protein in rice was superior to that in rice and chicken. Now, humans are somewhat different than rats, although some people think there's no difference between the species, at least nutritionally, there is a difference between the species. Now, Kofangi tried another test. He took men and put them on eggs as a principal source of calories and principal source of protein. And he found that the men required 9% of the total calories and protein when they're eating eggs to just balance out even. That means that they needed at least 9% to just get the protein they needed, and they had no excess of 9%. Now when he changed their diet to make it two-thirds potatoes and one-third eggs, he found that they needed 30% less protein than they needed on eggs alone. The potatoes made the diet much more efficient for man than the eggs alone, so that when we talk about potatoes being inferior to eggs, that certainly doesn't seem to be true with man. So we learn quite a bit about the question of how humans react on vegetable proteins and animal proteins. There are other problems with high protein diets I ought to discuss. For example, Dr. Linksweiler of the University of Wisconsin has been doing studies on 20-year-old young men, and she feeds them diets of different protein amounts. For example, she did a study where they were on a diet of 8% protein, 16% protein, and 24% protein. And she found on the 8% protein diet, when they had calcium in the amounts from 5 to 1,400 milligrams a day, that's equivalent to about a half a quart of milk to about a quart and a half of milk a day, that at all these levels, at 8% protein, at all these levels, the, these young people absorbed more calcium into their bodies and into their bones than they poured out through the urine. But when they got to 16% total calories and protein, and remember the average American eats 20% of their total calories and protein, at 16% they absorbed nothing from the milk. More calcium went out through the urine than they took in with up to a quart and a half of milk a day. And when they got to 24% total calories and protein, not any of them could maintain what we call a positive calcium balance. Everyone lost tremendous amounts of calcium through the urine compared to what they took in with up to a quart and a half of milk a day. The high protein diets force the body to take calcium out of its bones if you don't have enough calcium in your diet to neutralize the problems of the high protein diet. That's why I believe osteoporosis or weakened bones are so much an epidemic in this country because nutritionists tell us and food manufacturers encourage us to eat a high protein diet. This forces calcium out of your bones unless you're drinking five quarts of milk a day and you then develop weak and porous bones. Now these are 20 year old young men who are active because if you're not as active as these young men you're going to lose calcium out of your bones just from inactivity. So the high protein diet is absolutely the wrong thing for man the average American having 20% of the total calories and protein, it should be absolutely no more than 15%. I diet would recommend 13%. And even if you're an experienced dietitian, you'd have a very difficult time figuring out a diet of natural foods that's less than 10% or 9% of total calories and protein. And yet, you can get down as far as 6 or 7% and not be deficient. So that as far as protein deficiency, it's almost impossible to reach that uh, level. That's the least thing we have to worry about in our country is protein deficiency.